Okay, so watching a Jordan Peterson versus Matt Dillahunty debate. And one of the main thrusts of Jordan Peterson's argument is that the Judeo-Christian ethic undergirds our entire civil moral foundation of our entire civilization and it's essential to where we are as a culture today. That's one of his main arguments. It's one of his main talking points. Matt Dillahunty counters with just because something is useful doesn't mean it is true. Another thing Jordan Peterson has referenced in his prior work, not necessarily in this, he wasn't necessarily discussing it in this particular debate, but he has talked about the psychological utility of religion. So again, the counter-argument from Matt Dillahunty, just because something is useful doesn't mean it's true. Point well taken, fair enough. But I would, I would think that there would be maybe half the atheists would argue with the idea that it's useful. I bet you anything they don't think it's useful, I bet you they think it's poison. And I've heard them talk about it, they think it's toxic and they think it's poison. So Matt Dillahunty says, just because something is useful doesn't mean it's true. Is it useful? Let's just take the first part. Is religion in general, Christianity in particular, useful? And let's look at what Jordan Peterson calls the psychological utility of religion. See if it in fact exists. See if there is such a thing. Now, I'm going to do about seven of these. But let's start with your marriage, if you happen to be married. And I'll tell you, as I am wont to do, I will tell you from my own personal experience, in a way that you can easily identify as true, the psychological utility of Christianity in particular in my own life, in relation to my, my marriage. Bible itself. The great book of hate, the great book of where God's only commanding genocides and, you know, smiting Midianites and apparently that's the only thing in the ha that happens in the Bible. But if you turn to the Bible for help in walking out a Christian marriage and healing your marriage and bringing stability, sanity and peace of mind into your marriage, guess what? You will find it profoundly useful. I'll give you just two scriptures. Let nothing come out of your mouth except that it be for the edification of others. That's one. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. Willing to suffer wrong. That's the key to the whole verse. Willing to suffer wrong. That's two. And then I'll give you a third scripture. Be not a hearer of the word, but be a doer also. Those three scriptures alone haven't even gone deep into the Bible. I just pulled out three scriptures. You enact those scriptures. You walk out those scriptures in your marriage and you see the difference for yourself. Those three scriptures alone can heal your marriage. They can transform your marriage. Revolutionize or at least radically improve it. Trust me, they can. Let's take the first one. Let nothing come out of your mouth except for it be for the edification of others. Why do I use the third scriptures? Because you actually have to internalize it. You, have to, you actually have to try to live it out. You can't just read it. The Bible is a book of instructions at its most useful. It is a book of instructions to you, the reader. It isn't something you're supposed to be reading to, you know, point out, oh, look, here, I found the loophole here. Oh, look, here, I found the loophole here. Good. But you're also not using it correctly. Good for you. Very clever. But you're not using the Bible correctly and you aren't reading it correctly. If you want it to actually bear fruit in your life, if you want to give it, if you want to see if it really is words of truth, Try to walk it out for real. Try to internalize the instructions to you, the individual. Then you'll see the difference. Just those two scriptures alone. I'll just break those down for you. Let nothing come out of your mouth except for the be, be for the edification of others. Try and put that into effect in your marriage. I did. It will transform your marriage. Why? Because most of what destroys a marriage is, is, is the, the terrible things you say to one another. The terrible things that you say to one another in the course of marriage, especially when marriages are getting difficult. Now, I love my wife now uh, a lot. Wow do, I, wow, do I like my wife now. But she started out difficult. First five years of her marriage were really tough because she had a lot of issues from her childhood that she needed to work out. And maybe I had some too. 
So I'm just examining if Christianity is useful in the context of a marriage. And I found it radically transformational, useful to the point of saved a marriage. And I'm only giving you two examples. Those are two scriptures that I tried to actually enact. I tried to internalize and walk out in my actual marriage. Let nothing come out of your mouth except for be for the edification of others. Because that's what you do in a marriage when things start getting tough. You let your flesh get the better of you and you start talking. And the things you start saying aren't constructive. They are destructive. And you say them a lot. And you say them constantly. And you start to wear at each other with your words. And you start to harm each other with your words. Something in you knows it, but you keep yielding to it. Why? Because it's human nature. That's why so few marriages, when they hit the difficult parts of their marriage, so few of them make it through. Because one, they don't keep their voice. They stop themselves. They don't stop themselves from saying exactly what they feel like saying in the moment. Bring ruin and destruction through their mouth. You don't believe me that those two scriptures alone can... can dramatically improve your marriage, put them into effect. You'll see yourself. You'll see immediately. You'll see within two weeks. If you stop yourself from saying negative, destructive things just to your wife and only say things that are encouraging, edifying, building, only try to build her up, that alone, two weeks, will dramatically improve your marriage. Psychologically useful. I'd say so. Now, let's go to the scripture on love. Love is willing to suffer wrong. Internalize that. Internalize that aspect of what the Bible tells you love is. Forget about the other ones. Because again, people are naturally self-centered. When they say love, they start looking for a feeling. Oh, lovey-dovey, I love you. That's not, that's not healing love. Healing love is I love you, it hurts. Ow, why? Because I'm, oh, I'm going to take it. Why? Because I love you. That's healing love. If you're struggling with your kids, try putting that type of love into effect. Not the love, how you make me feel. That's easy love. It's easy to love somebody that makes you feel good. Bible talks about that. It's easy to love somebody that makes you feel good and warm and healthy. The type of love that the Bible is talking about, the type of love that is useful for, for transforming a bad situation or a hard situation into a loving one, is the love that costs you something. Willing to suffer wrong. That means when your wife is in your face for the 50th time in a row, you don't say anything back because the Bible has told you not to say, to say nothing except for it be for the edification of others. And you're trying to internalize that. And then you become willing to take it. Willing to suffer wrong because out of love. Give you more. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Try to walk that out. Tell me that's not psychologically useful. Tell me it's not useful. Try it. Walk it out. You may come to find that these are the words of God himself. If you try to actually enact them correctly. Why? Because you'll see the fruit immediately. You'll see the wisdom immediately. The catch is you can't just listen to it. You have to actually try to do it. That's the catch. That's why there's so few true Christians. Remember the true Scotsman fallacy? Here's the true Scotsman fallacy. There's too few of us. There's too few Christians who are actually trying to live as the Bible instructs you to live. That's why you don't see it out there in the world. Because it's hard to do. Your flesh wars against it. It's not natural to you. It is a war against what's natural to you. The spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit. They're contrary one to another. Put it into a real world situation. Okay? We're talking about healing your marriage. I'll tell you one thing from personal experience. Sometimes when my wife was in her difficult phase, she would come home and look for trouble. Look for something to start a fight. She'd examine the apartment. Anybody who knows someone like this, you'll, you'll recognize this immediately. She'd examine the apartment. Look at it. I'd see it on her. Oh, God. Here she goes. She's looking all over the apartment. Oh, what? did you use this pillow today? Did you use this pillow? And then she'll look for something to start getting in your face about until you fight. And she wouldn't stop until you fought. What do you do about it? Do you love her? Yeah. Willing to suffer wrong. You take it. And you swallow. You swallow. You crucify your flesh in the moment. 
<laughs> I love you, honey. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. That's why so few people do it. Yeah, it's really hard. Did you use this pillow again? Uh, <laughs> sweetheart, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, try it. Try it. Try and act it out in real life. The Christianity that actually works, the Christianity that is true, the Christianity that is of the true Scotsman and will produce truth and produce good fruits in your life, it's hard to live out in the real world. It costs you something. It's not easy. That's why you don't see it enacted. But that's a subject for another day. I'm just examining whether, the, whether Christianity in, gen, in particular is psychologically useful. And I say, yes. Just the two scriptures alone. Just those two scriptures alone. The, the idea of sowing mercy into your marriage. Third. Third concept. Right there. Profoundly useful. It will transform your marriage or dramatically improve it. Just try those two things. That's it. That's it for now.